just try it. Like if you don't like it, it's fine. But ultimately, if the more and more that we move to eating more fruit and vegetables and things that that aren't harming our environment, the better that it is for the environment, but also the better it is for our bodies or mind and all of that sort of stuff. Today, food trends are one of the most common long-lasting trends that people follow. Some people become pescatarian, gluten-free, vegan, etc. to get more Instagram likes, but many do it because of what is going on in the food industry surrounding the food they've decided not to eat. I wanted to learn more, so I read some books and did a few interviews to educate myself. As you probably know, there are plenty of food trends out there, but how do you know which is which? Here's a list of 15 food trends and diets varying from ones we all know and recognize, like vegetarian, gluten-free, and dairy-free, to ones that I'd never even heard of, such as flescatarian, mental health foods, and volumetric dieting. First on my list is vegan, which is someone who doesn't eat anything with animal products, including milk, butter, honey, cheese, any sort of meat, including seafood, and these sorts of people may even live a lifestyle without animal products in it. A vegetarian, on the other hand, is someone who doesn't eat meat itself. They would not eat beef or pork, but they might eat milk or cheese. Next up is a pescatarian, which is similar to vegetarian, except for they do eat seafood or fish, but no other meat. Someone who's gluten-free does not eat anything containing gluten, which means most breads they don't eat unless it doesn't contain wheat. They wouldn't eat, for example, Cheez-Its or goldfish or any other sort of cracker-like item that has wheat in it. Someone who is dairy-free doesn't eat any dairy, so they would not eat any sort of cheese, any butter, any milk, or anything like that. Dairy-free people might choose not to eat eggs, but that depends on their choices. A flexitarian is a semi-vegetarian, or someone who tries to be vegetarian most of the time, but it's not set in stone as a rule in their life. Mental health foods are foods that include dark and leafy greens, nuts and seeds, and foods that are rich in omega-3 fatty acids, such as salmon. These people might eat beans, kale, blueberries, avocados, etc. Someone who is following a ketogenic diet eats high-fat, low-carb foods with the goal of burning fats rather than carbs for energy. Someone who is on a low-waste food diet is not really on a diet. They're more trying to find foods that aren't wrapped in a bunch of plastic, for example, so they aren't creating a bunch of waste with what they eat. Fusion cuisine is cuisine that combines two different cultures or cuisines together to make one specific dish. An example of this might be Indian curry and a pot pie. Someone on a Paleolithic diet eats foods similar to what our ancient ancestors might have eaten, usually by hunting and gathering, which means they might eat a lot of berries and beans, but they wouldn't eat bread, which you have to bake and cook. A DASH diet is a diet that includes fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and other low-fat foods that are trying to help reduce high blood pressure. And DASH stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hyperextension. Someone who does intermittent fasting is someone who eats with a fasting schedule. This might mean that every Friday they don't eat lunch or every 12 hours they skip on a meal. Someone on a volumetric diet eats low calorie, high nutrient foods with a goal of losing weight. Intuitive eating is eating what you want, when you want, not following the three meals a day sort of plan that most people follow. This person will stop eating when they're full and they are very in tune with what their body needs or wants. I wanted a first person perspective, so I talked to two people. The first was Deborah Shafrath, who is gluten free and plant based. I noticed that I was having just, my stomach was feeling yucky when I was eating. And I had some allergy testing done mm -hmm. that came back noting that I have an allergic reaction to gluten, okay. wheat, and some other, other foods as well. And at the time, I was advised to just cut wheat, gluten, cold turkey. Like just 
cut it out of your diet. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh my gosh, how am I ever gonna do this? But I did it and I felt amazing overnight. It was such a profound difference of how I felt after I ate that I've just stuck with that for more than two years now. The plant base came a little bit of a different way because as I am approaching my vintage age, vintage <laughs> years, <laughs> when I go to see my doctor I'm asking a lot of questions and are there things that I should be thinking about or preparing myself for as I go into the phase of entering my 50s as opposed to being in my 40s. And she had noted that, in, my doctor had noted in her practice, she had found that most of her patients did really well, well when they started to slowly transition towards plant-based, a plant-based diet. And so because I love cooking, I love experimenting with different foods, I love researching all types of things like that. I tried it out. And so during last year, I started doing a lot of research and found, oh my gosh, there's some interesting things that I could try out. And I found that the, that it was, e it was an easier shift than one would think. Before changing her diet, Deborah Shafrath did a lot of research on food alternatives for dairy, meat, and of course, gluten. In the past few years, the number of vegetarian, dairy-free, and gluten-free alternatives have grown. However, the alternatives are still being popularized and are usually more expensive than the normal options. This doesn't mean vegetarian, dairy-free, or gluten-free eaters are out of options. It just means they have to be more creative with their ideas, which is why I decided to talk to Deborah Shafrath, a walking food alternative encyclopedia, to learn more. During our conversation, I put together a list of foods Deborah doesn't eat and the alternatives she uses instead, in addition to her health and food advice on some of these specific items. First up is meat, which you can substitute with tofu or tempeh. They're high in protein and they're low in fat if, if you're looking at your fat intake. For chicken, you can substitute it with jackfruit. It shreds kind of like chicken. It does not taste like chicken, but the texture is a little bit like chicken if you're looking to make like, I don't know, burritos or things like that. For protein in general, chickpeas, lentils, and beans are great substitutes. Protein does not have to come from meats. Hmm. Meats tend to be a really good source for iron and, and protein. However, you can also get a similar impact on your body from plants. If you're looking for a way to stabilize hormones and things like that, which women, when we enter into our 50s and 60s are really trying to do, you don't wanna be artificially putting hormones into your body. Not that it, there's a substantial amount, but the point is, is I was surprised by that research that I came across from various sources on just the negative impact of animal protein and most importantly dairy on the body and body function. In substitution for dairy milk, almond milk, hemp milk, coconut milk, oat milk, and more are great milks. There are a variety of substitutes for dairy cheese which include yeast flakes and that adds a nice cheesy taste to stuff. They're really high in vitamin B6, B12, all of your bees. White beans. It's amazing what you can do with white beans like cannoli beans or navy beans. Those ground up serve really nice like in a lasagna instead of ricotta. And raw cashews for a creamy sauce. If I'm looking to make something kind of creamy, I often use raw cashews that I grind up or I'll use tahini. One of Deborah's favorite substitutes for dairy ice cream is oat ice cream. It doesn't like taste all yucky in your mouth. There isn't a residual milky taste in your mouth when you eat oat-based ice cream. Coconut milk ice cream is also good. A great substitute for dairy yogurt is coconut yogurt. You wouldn't want to eat a whole lot of them because they're highly caloric, but they're really great. In baking and cooking, flax seeds are a good substitute for eggs. A substitute for cornstarch is arrowroot powder. I don't put a lot of corn in my body if I can help it because it's just everywhere, it's prolific. Substitutes for bread include rice cakes and buckwheat flour bread. 
in addition to a variety of other options. I was talking to someone the other day and she was saying, I just love meatballs. And I was like, well, I do too. When I make meatballs that have like mushrooms and lots of veggies and walnuts and things like that, I just can't have in my mind that it's gonna taste like a veal, beef, pork meatball. It's going to taste different, but really delicious. In conclusion, if you want to change your diet, there are so many options and alternatives to try. Your food might taste different, but it will still be healthy and delicious if you make it without meat or dairy or gluten. The next person I talked to was Jamie Shavrath, a vegetarian and pescatarian of over 40 years. Jamie's story is a heart-wrenching one. Imagine you're five years old. You have a favorite pet an animal best friend who you will trust, cherish, and love forever. One day, Fluffy your bunny, Snickers your puppy, or El Toro your bull ends up on your dinner plate. This is what happened to Jamie Shafrath when her playmate and pet, a bull named El Toro from the Shafrath family farm, was slaughtered for meat. This very traumatic event would shape Jamie's future dietary decisions. Jamie became a fully vegetarian and many times didn't even trust what her mom was serving her. I did eat chicken until I was about 13. The family farm had chicken barns and so in each chicken barn there was about 300,000 chickens. When I saw the process of how chickens were made, I stopped eating chicken. When I was about 25 years old, at that point I had not eaten any meat whatsoever. I was working for the Hyatt. During the banquet, I had asked for a vegetarian meal. Essentially, like a bowl of fruit came to my table. On that night, I had salmon for the first time cooked right. And so I started eating fish. Jamie eats fish meat and no other kinds of meat. And that's just been my lifestyle all my life, really. It was very unusual for Jamie to order a meat-free meal. She remembers ending up with a bowl of green beans, cheese, or bread at school. There was no vegetarian option for meals. It was not cool. There was no coolness in and around being a vegetarian. There was no trends in and around, you know, eating it because, you know, a plant-based diet is better for you. That was not the case for me at all. It was really that I could not stomach eating my friends. Jamie often made her own meal or had a different meal. This was and is her way of life. So I asked her what her favorite meals were. If I were to be given my last meal, popcorn's like one of my absolute favorite snacks. But in terms of a meal, it would be like, it would be like a baguette with mozzarella cheese, basil, a glass of wine, and some tomato. I love making salmon. On the grill is my favorite, making sure that it's smoked and it's just perfectly done. Otherwise, I, I like pastas with basil and fresh vegetables and stuff like that. It's really that simple. I think of how many times I've eaten pasta with veggies or salmon or a mozzarella, basil, and tomato baguette. It really is that simple. Jamie Shafrath talked about how animal treatment changed her mind about meat and made her decide to go pescatarian. After I did a little research, I realized that it is utterly inhumane what we do to our beef, pork, and poultry in today's industrial food factories. I call it an industrial food factory because most of the food we eat from the supermarket is mass produced in big industrial settings, not at the happy farm ideal. First, I came across the issue of animals being shoved into ridiculously small living spaces and pens. I was fairly surprised that we were willing to do this until I thought about it some more. Mass production usually means getting things done as fast, cheap, and easy as possible. It's not a huge surprise that food manufacturers would give up the happy farm ideal for a beef, pork, or poultry mass production factory. Because we are mass producing these animals, we are using up a lot of food resources at a fairly high rate. Some estimates say that as much as 95% of the energy farm animals consume is being put into animal parts we don't eat. That is a lot of energy to be losing. We could feed as many as 3 billion more humans if we spent less time mass producing animals the way we are now, according to some estimates. To make matters worse, this animal mass production has as bad or even worse an environmental impact as all cars, trains, 
and airplanes combined. Additionally, I learned that for beef, pork, and poultry in industrial food factories, mothers are artificially inseminated so they get pregnant or ready to lay eggs as quickly and efficiently as possible over and over and over again until they're ready for eating. In egg factories, male chicks are considered worthless and slaughtered soon after hatching. With pigs and cows, the young are taken away from their mother after a few short weeks or even days. I can't imagine the trauma that would cause me, let alone the billions of farm animals that go through this every year. And it doesn't end there. Many animals are being fed solely corn, which doesn't seem bad until you realize that animals like cows are not built to eat corn. Cows are grazers, which means their stomachs are built to eat a variety of grasses, which break down very differently from corn. Though eating corn fattens the cows up faster, it can cause changes in the acids of their stomachs, which can cause their stomachs to, in a way, erode and allow the stomach acids to get into their bloodstreams. This is only an example of animal feeding issues within industrial factory farms. The list goes on and on about what is wrong. However, we as consumers can do something about this by carefully choosing what meats we buy and eat. We can purchase from small local farms who are environmentally, and most importantly, animal friendly. If that doesn't work for you, choosing organic is an option, though definitely not the perfect solution, which I'll tell you guys about more later. Looking at farm animal treatment made me wonder, what about the fish? I decided to dig a little deeper by reading World Without Fish by Mark Kurlansky. Kurlansky is a journalist who writes about the issues surrounding overfishing. A World Without Fish dives deeper into the history of industrial fishing, the disruption this has to natural order between species, and possible solutions. He uses Charles Darwin's theory of evolution to point out that natural disturbances and changes will occur in nature. However, at the scale we are overfishing, among other things, we are disrupting those natural disturbances. The fish are connected through many natural cycles to so many other species that a drastic loss of fish, which is happening now, could end up speeding up human extinction. This isn't a very positive thing to read, and the story behind it isn't that positive either. As fishing technologies grew and the industry became more industrialized, fishermen started catching fish at record numbers. In many countries, the fishermen themselves went to the government to ask for regulations to be passed about overfishing. But the government scientists claimed that nature's bounty ensured that fish could never go extinct. The idea of nature's bounty is a myth. Nature doesn't follow human ideals or rules. Anyway, as fishing went from hook and line to beam trawler, overfishing became a very real thing. Recently, governments have begun to do a few things, but not enough. There are five key things we can do to help. First, eat sustainable seafood by looking out for cheap fish or suddenly popular kinds of fish. If you visit www.msc org or notice their symbol on any seafood you're purchasing, then that seafood is most likely sustainable. Three, farmed fish are not a solution to overfishing because the tight living conditions of the fish change their natural instincts for migration, feeding, and reproduction. They'll never be able to be put back in the wild. Also, they're treated similar to land animals, so be careful about them. Fourth, Never eat shark or bluefin tuna because they're both in danger of extinction. Sharks produce very few offspring, which means they're more likely to go extinct if their numbers dwindle, which is happening. Bluefin tuna are migratory, which means it is hard to put regulations on fishing them. Don't help them go extinct by eating them. Fifth, but not lastly, always ask how the seafood got to you. This is a great way to learn where your fish came from, how it was fished, and whether it was farmed. Furthermore, if the seller doesn't know the answer, your question is going to encourage them to ask questions and educate themselves. Animal treatment and overfishing isn't the only reason people are changing their diet. There is lots of information, old and new, that points to the increasing unhealthiness of food, particularly in the United States. According to Michael Pollan in The Omnivore's Dilemma, corn is taking over our food almost literally. 
you can find a corn product in between a third, which is the lowest estimate, and 75%, the highest estimate, of the products at the supermarket. If you include meat, your estimate will be even higher because almost all beef, pork, and poultry that we consume eats, you guessed it, corn. Corn-fed animals, and cows in particular, don't have an equal balance of omega-3 and omega-6, as well as a variety of other important vitamins and minerals. This means that the healthiness of a corn-fed animal is less than that of a grass-fed animal, which means one that is truly and properly grass-fed, not one that is offered a few grains at the end of its life. This is only one example of how we are losing the health benefits of many foods. Perhaps by choosing our food the way we might research and choose a landscaper for our backyards, a designer if we were renovating, or the right mattress for our bed, we can learn a lot more about the health benefits and the story behind the food we eat. In the past 30 years, interest in organic foods has boomed. However, they might not be quite as great as we think they are. When they first became a thing, organic foods generally came from small local farms that never used chemical herbicides or pesticides. However, most organic foods now are mass-produced in factory-like settings. Organic foods, whether animals or plants, live in slightly better, but generally the same living conditions as non-organic, industrial-produced foods. Organic seems to have become a trademark instead of a farming aspiration. Organic has lost its meaning. During my research, I came to several important conclusions about what I had learned. First, I learned about food trends. For many, food trends are like a new culture of food. Not eating meat or dairy or gluten, etc. for all of your meals is no different than eating rice or tortillas or beer or cheese at every meal. I also learned that the food factory industry, poultry, beef, pork, fish, and more today is not something to be proud of. However, for those of us who have the privilege, we can vote with our forks, as Michael Pollan calls it, by making conscious choices about all the food we buy and eat. We can make a difference in small ways for our own health, against animal treatment, and for the future of our species, planet, and the environment. I encourage you to figure out whether your food is healthy or produced in an environmentally and animal-friendly way by reading the label. Here you can look at the various stamps to discern whether it was grown sustainably or not, and so much more. Additionally, look at the ingredients when buying your food. Always ask yourself, does it contain ingredients I need a chemistry degree to pronounce or understand? Is this food going to rot eventually? If you cannot pronounce some ingredients, then the food has something highly processed in it that you probably don't want to be eating. If the food isn't going to rot or get moldy eventually, it's good to find an alternative to that food item. Lastly, I learned that you don't have to become vegetarian, vegan, or dairy-free to make a difference. You can still learn more about how to make a difference by researching topics that you are interested in and spreading awareness about what you learned.